Hello and welcome to Car Church. Whether you're joining us for the first time or you've been with us from the very beginning, we're just thankful to be with you tonight and to have you here. Uh, it's starting to rain here a little bit, but that's okay. Patty and I were talking about it the first night we began Car Church. It was a drenching rain. So we're expectant that the Lord's going to pour out His Spirit on us tonight as we go to the Word of God. And tonight we're going to be almost entirely in one passage of Scripture, which is Psalm 62. So if you want to get your Bible and turn there, that's really where we're going to be tonight in the moments that we share together. And I'm going to invite Patty to pray for us and just to say hello. Thank you for joining us tonight. Let's pray. Oh, Father, thank you for your great love for us. Thank you for all of your many, many, many blessings. Help us to learn to receive all that you have for us. Thank you for your word, for speaking to us through your word. Thank you for Mike and the anointing that's on him, that you will use him to speak to us tonight. Open our hearts to hear what you have for us, and we give you all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So Psalm 62 tonight is where we're going to be, and as I was praying this week about what to share this evening, this passage of Scripture came to me, and the Lord really began to speak to me about it. Uh, you know, I've called this passage, this message tonight, a calm resolve. And when I think about this idea of a calm resolve, what I'm really talking about is the difference between living from the inside out versus living from the outside in. And I think that you'll see as we go through this tonight that the difference is so significant. But in the light of what we constantly focus on and make our, our baseline, if I'm living from the outside in, largely I'm going to be living by my will, by my emotions, by my intellect, by my passions that are going to be worked on by the externals around me. When I'm living from the inside out, I'm going to be dwelling in the presence of the Lord, living out of His life, living out of the realm of the Spirit, and not out of the realm of the flesh, and it's a completely different approach. And so a calm resolve comes from living from the inside out and not allowing ourselves to be pulled into living from the outside in. The problem is, that the outside is loud, it's noisy, it's demanding, it's insistent, it's relentless. Whereas the inside, the realm of the spirit is quiet, it's still, it is a whisper, it has to be attended to, it doesn't demand attention as much as it invites our attention. Let's look at what the psalmist has to say here. Psalm of David, Psalm 62. He says in verse 1, Truly my soul silently waits for God. From him comes my salvation, for he only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be greatly moved. Let's pause for just a minute and think about this. The word here for soul in the Hebrew language is the Hebrew word nefesh. In the, in the uh, New Testament Greek, the, the, Hebrew, the Greek word is different, but it means the same thing. In, in the New Testament, we have a word that's suke. In the Old Testament, it's nefesh, but it means the same. It's the seat of our emotions, of our passions. It's the activity of our mind, the activity of our will. It's the seat of our appetites. It's what we would call the self or the personal. It's the desire. It's the individual. It's this picture of our mind, our intellect, our will, our emotions, our passions, the, the uh, seat of our appetites. That's the soul. Different from the spirit. The spirit Numa in the Greek, ruach in the, in the Hebrew, it's the part of us that relates to God. It's this, the part of us that's eternal. But the soul is the 
personality, the emotions, the will, the mind. You know, it's interesting how it works is that our emotions and our intellect work together to direct our will. So we think things through, we get emotionally connected to something, and then we act upon it with our physical nature. Well, that's what the soul is. It's that lower part of us, not the spiritual part, but the lower part. But notice what he says here. Truly my soul silently waits for God. Now what he's talking about here, the word to silently wait, it means silence, to be still, to, to be in a state of repose. It means the silent expectation of divine aid. That's a literal translation from the Greek. It means to have confidence in God. So it's a confident waiting in silent expectation upon divine aid. Notice this idea. The psalmist is taking a deliberate action to silence his soul. His mind is running. His emotions are racing. His will is engaging. But what does he do? He says, my soul is going to silently go into a state of repose. And instead of being activated by soulish activity, I'm going to silently wait on the Lord in confident expectation that he is going to give the action, give the wisdom, give the direction, give the guidance that's necessary for me to face whatever the situation is. Now we're going to find out in just a minute how critical this is. You know, the Bible says, be still and know that I am God. The obvious implication of that is, if I'm not still, I won't know. I won't know that He is God and I'll be focused on me, on what's going on around me, on what other people are saying to me, on the noise and the confusion of thought and conspiracies of men that are all around me, and I'm going to be captivated in those things. It's only when I still my soul, when I say to my mind, be quiet. When I say to my emotions, settle down. When I say to my will, stop. And I find myself in that state of repose. In that state of repose, I'm in a position to prepare in confident expectation in a calm, resolute attitude on the Lord's wisdom, His direction, His plan, His purpose. When we talk about the difference between me trying to live my life for Jesus versus Jesus living his life through me, it really comes down to, in practice, this very critical idea. The soul is like a restless ocean, it's, and it's easily uh, acted upon by the world around me. You know, the ocean, when the wind blows, the ocean starts getting rough. And in the same way, when the circumstances of life, the conspiracies of men, the noise of the world, the, the activity of the adversary goes to work on my soul, my soul starts to get agitated. And, and then it starts to act out of emotion, out of my perspective of what's going on, out of things that might be taking me off track. But when my soul comes to a place of repose, and silently begins to wait, I'm starting to draw upon the realm of the spirit and not the realm of the soulish nature. Now this is important because he says, my soul silently waits for God because from him comes my salvation. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be greatly moved. And the word moved there means to be shaken. Now think about this with me. When I start to silently wait on the Lord and tell my soul to be still, then I begin to realize it's from the Lord comes my salvation. You know, the word for salvation here is an interesting word. It's the Hebrew word, Yeshua. Have you ever heard that word before? You know, the name Jesus is Yeshua. It's Yahshua 
or the same word as Joshua. Joshua means the Lord is, or Yahweh is, my salvation. Well, here we see that when it says that the, that the Lord is, my soul waits silently for God. From him comes my salvation. He, is, he alone is my rock and my salvation. It's saying literally that, that God is my Yeshua. He is my salvation. He is Jesus. My salvation is Jesus. We've talked about Romans 5.10 that Jesus died to reconcile us to God so that we might be saved by his life. Christ in me is the hope of glory. His life, his presence, his power, his wisdom, his strength, his character, his nature, his giftings. That is what brings salvation to me. Yeshua, salvation is Christ himself. But the thing is, when I am not still, when my mind is racing, when I'm letting the winds of the world blow against my soul and create agitation, then I no longer look to the Lord as my Yeshua, as my salvation. Instead, I start to try and figure things out. I start to react out of my emotions. I start to get in the turmoil of trying to get my will engaged, trying to figure out what to do. That's why David understood my soul must silently wait for God because it's from him that my salvation comes. He's my rock. He's that solid thing in the midst of the sinking sands. He is my salvation. He's my defense. The word here for defense means a high place. There's a reason why you need to know this. A high place, a refuge, a secure height. It's a stronghold. It literally means a lofty place affording shelter and security. You see, when I'm operating in the Spirit, I'm in a high place. The Bible says, when my heart is overwhelmed within me, lead me to the rock that's higher than I am. I'm operating in the realm of the Spirit, not in the lower nature of the flesh, but in the higher nature of the Spirit. And I'm in a place of shelter, and I'm a place of refuge. I'm in a place of security. I'm in a lofty place. He is my defense, and I shall not be greatly moved. I think this word is interesting because the word moved here, it means to be, to totter, to shake, to slip, to be shaken or overthrown or dislodged. It means to be greatly shaken. When I'm operating in the Spirit, I'm in a lofty place. I'm in the realm of the Spirit, not the lower place of the flesh, but the higher place of the Spirit. And there I begin to discover that the Lord is my salvation. The Lord is my rock. The Lord is my strong tower. Let me pause for a minute and note something here. There's a difference between somebody bringing me salvation, bringing me or putting me in a place of refuge, uh, handing me or placing me on a rock and them being my salvation, being my rock, being my strong tower. The difference is significant. For example, if I'm in a place where I am, I am, you know, starving to death and I'm about to die and somebody brings me food, they may be my rescuer, but the food is my salvation. The food is what saved me. They brought it to me, but it was the food that saved me. If I say that God is my Savior, I'm saying that he brings me salvation. But when I say that God himself is my salvation, I'm saying that he not only is bringing me something, he is the very thing I need. Well, when I say that Christ provides for me, that's something separate from him. But when I say he is my provision, I'm saying that it's actually him that I need. Now, when you think about this in relationship to the idea of Christ, who is my life, then I, when uh, Paul says, for to me, to live is Christ. He's not saying I am living for Christ. He's saying for me to live is Christ. He's saying, when Christ, who is my life, in Colossians 3, verses 1 through 4, 
So it's a difference because now I'm not just saying, Lord, help me, Lord, provide for me, Lord, give me or save me. Or I'm saying, Lord, you are my salvation. You are my rock. You are my refuge and strong tower. You are that lofty place. It makes it not just a relationship of organization. It's a relationship of organic union. Christ in me is my salvation. I can't have the salvation that he wants to bring, the deliverance that he wants to bring apart from him. That's what happens when I'm living my life for Christ is I'm asking him to give me something so that I can then employ what he gives me to get what I need. But when he is my salvation, I'm not asking him to give me something. I'm asking him to be something, to be something in me, to be something through me, to be something for me so that he becomes my salvation. He is my defense. He is my rock. He is my salvation. Now, going just a little bit further, I want you to see what he begins to say here in verse 3 and 4. Because here we see that the, the, the psalmist has started with the solution. I like that. I like to start with the solution. Where am I trying to get to? Then when I start to see how the world and the flesh and the devil works, I know what's different from what I'm trying to get to. What I'm trying to get to is for my soul to be silenced, to wait patiently and confidently upon God to allow him to become something in me, not just to do something for me, but to become something in me so that he becomes my rock, my salvation, my defense, and then I'm not shaken. Now, the reason why I need to know that's the goal is because now he tells me what I'm up against, what's going to be fighting that goal. He says, how long will you attack a man you shall all be slain, all of you, like a leaning wall and a tottering fence. They only consult to cast him down from his high position. They delight in lies. They bless with their mouth, but they curse inwardly. Here he's giving us a picture of the adversaries, the world, the flesh, the devil, the forces that work to try and pull us out of the spirit. And notice what he says here. How long will you attack a man? This word, attack, in the Hebrew word, it means to shout at, to be frantic at, to assail, to break in, to overwhelm, and to rush upon. The King James Version says, how long will you imagine mis mischief? You see, that's what the world, the flesh, and the devil do against me. They imagine mischief. They shout at me. They're frantic at me. They assail me. They break in. They try and overwhelm me. They try and rush in upon me. That's the way these adversaries work. How long will you shout at, be frantic at, assail, break in, overwhelm, rush at me? World, flesh, enemy, coming at me like this, trying to agitate my soul and my flesh and to get me activated in that realm. But he says, you will be slain, all of you. In other words, these enemies will be put to death. The, the flesh, the Bible says, has been put to death on the cross. The Bible says that the world, I'm crucified to the world and the world to me. And the Bible says that the devil has no power over me any longer because of the cross. So these things are not meant to be what I'm listening to what I'm paying attention to. He says they're meant to be like a leaning wall and a tottering fence to fall down because the only reason the world, the flesh, or the enemies consults with us, the only reason that it advises us, it tries to give us counsel, it tries to conspire, is, he says, to cast us down from our high position. They delight in lies, they bless with their mouth, mouth, but they curse inwardly. In other words, the world, the flesh, and the devil are about subterfuge. They're about duplicity. They're about mixed motives. They're saying something's important that's not important. They're lying to us. They are speaking all sorts of things, yelling, 
screaming, imagining mischief, being frantic, assailing us, shouting at us. But why? Only one reason. That the enemy, the world, the flesh, or the devil, these three arenas, the only reason they engage us or consult with us is for one reason. To cast us down from our high position. You see, when, we're, when our soul is still, when we're waiting patiently on the Lord, He becomes our lofty place, our salvation, and our defense, and we're not greatly shaken. But when the world engages us, it's to try and pull us out of the Spirit into the flesh. And I'm telling you, listen, let's be honest. He's pretty good at that, isn't he? You know, I can think of so many times in my life where I've been going along in the Spirit, and then all of a sudden, what happens? Think about this with me. All of a sudden, the world assails you. You know, it shouts at you. It tries to get frantic at you. I remember, for example, one time I was in a, a, a period of prayer, and I had decided to go in my room and kind of close the door. I was going to fast and pray for several days. And almost the minute I went and closed the door, outside the door, chaos broke loose. I could hear my, my daughters and my wife, and there were things going on, and I, I could hear it. You know, I was trying to put headphones on, so I couldn't hear it. But it was so loud, and the noise of what was going on, I didn't know what was happening. But there was something frantic. And it was just coming after me, trying to break into this high, lofty stronghold in the spirit where I was trying to get to. Well, before long, it got loud enough. I had to open the door, and out I went. And there was some chaos going on. There was some commotion going on. And, I mean, it was loud and noisy. Okay, so we, I worked it through. I talked. We prayed. We figured out what was going on. We got things settled down. Everything okay? Okay, good. Okay, I'm going to go back in close the door. I go back in to close the door, get silent, start to still my, and boom, it broke out again. <laughs> a couple of times happened before finally things got settled and we realized what was going on. This time I went in, I put on the headphones, I closed the door, I turned up the volume. I said, I'm staying in here. But you see the world, the flesh, the enemy is always trying to pull us out of that lofty place of the Spirit, where He is our salvation, He's our deliverance, He is our stronghold, He is our rock, He's handling the circumstances. This time, after prayer, I came out, the Lord had resolved all the things that were going on with the church, the things that were going on all around. All of that got resolved when I stayed in that place of prayer. The Lord started to act. You see, this can be true not just when you're in a period where you're trying to pray and seek the Lord about some specific thing and withdraw for a few days, but in the everyday reality of life, when the world starts to become frantic, when your flesh starts to get agitated, when the adversary starts to assail you with all sorts of fears and confusion and doubt and upsetness, what's the most important thing to do? First of all, remember the only reason why the enemy has engaged you, there's only one reason. He's trying to get you into the flesh. He's trying to pull you out of the lofty place of being in that silent waiting on the Lord and get you to engage your actions, to engage your intellect, to engage your emotions, to engage your will, to, to try and consult with you and connive and devise a plan to get you operating in the flesh. I can tell you, I know this because I've experienced it. This is how the adversary wants to pull us down. But notice what he says. He says, verse 5, But my soul, he comes back again, wait silently for God alone. You see, David's talking to his soul. He's saying, my soul, wait silently silently for God alone. Soul's getting agitated. Mind is racing. Emotions are agitated. Will is wanting like a horse in the gate to break out and do something. But what's David saying? My soul, wait silently for God alone. For my expectation is from him. 
You know, it's interesting, this word expectation literally means a cord or a rope. It's the Hebrew word tikva. I don't know if you've been much around the things of the Jewish people or the nation of Israel, but do you know what tikva is? It's the national anthem of Israel. It means the expectation. The word literally means a hope, what I hope for, my ground of hope. And it, it means a cord, and there's an interesting use of this word in the Old Testament. When Rahab knew that Israel was about to come and overthrow Jericho, Rahab dropped a, a red cord out of her window because the spies had told her her family would be rescued when the walls were overthrown if she would hang a cord, a red cord, scarlet cord, outside of her window. That's the same word, tikva. Her expectation, her ground of hope that her family would be rescued was the promise that had been made to her by the spies of Israel. And the, the scarlet cord was a representation of her expectation of hope. When the noise and the confusion and the battle was raging all around her, she was waiting patiently for her rescue to come from God. That's the way Israel looks at the nation of Israel, the land of promise. It was their hope. It was their expectation. And the national anthem is the tikva the expectation of hope. Well, here's the thing. Again, we see the goal. Now we see the adversary trying to pull us out of that place. Now we see David coming back. My expectation, my hope is from him, not from me. It's not up to me to face these problems. It's not up to me to come up with a solution. It's not up to me to control the situation. It's not up to me to engage my intellect, to engage my emotions, to engage my will, to engage my passions, to solve the problems. No, I'm silently waiting on the salvation of the Lord, of Christ's life through me to face the situation, to operate through me. I'm yielding that to him. He says, he is my defense. I shall not be moved. Can I tell you, I noticed one thing here. I noticed that in verse two, he says, I shall not be greatly moved. The implication there is, okay, I might get shaken, which is what the word means, but I won't be greatly shaken. But now he says, the Lord is my defense. I shall not be shaken. The implication is at all. You know, there's a picture of this in Psalm 56 where he says, At what time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. But then later in the same passage, he says, I will trust in thee and not be afraid. You see, you can say, when I get afraid, I'll trust in the Lord. Or you can say, you know, I'm just going to start trusting the Lord and not even be afraid. In the same way, he says in the beginning, he says to his soul, silently wait for the Lord and you will not be greatly shaken. Now he says, silently wait for God, put your hope in him. He's your rock, he's your salvation, he's your defense, and you won't even be shaken at all. In other words, that's where God's trying to get us to, where we're operating out of a calm resolve. The world's yelling at us, the world's assailing us, the enemy's frantically trying to get us agitated but we're in a place of calm resolve. I'm not going to be greatly shaken. As a matter of fact, I'm not gonna be shaken at all because I'm calmly trusting in the salvation of Christ's life to come to the deliverance of this situation. And he's going to be the one that does the work. Look what he says here in verse eight. Trust in him at all times. How many times? When it's really, really bad, when you've done everything you can do, when you've run out of options, when all of your energy is exhausted, no. He's saying trust in him at all times, you people. Pour out your heart before him, for God is a refuge for us. 
You know, it's interesting here where he says, pour out your heart. It means literally to pour it out like a drink offering. And the word here for heart has an interesting implication. It means our inner man, our mind, our will, our soul, our understanding. And in the Greek dictionary, uh, Hebrew dictionary, it means our inclinations, our resolutions, and our determinations. He says, if I will pour out like a drink offering, my mind, my will, my soul, my understanding, my inclinations, my resolutions, and my determinations. Those things that, what, that are, the enemy is trying to get me to engage in, he says, pour those out like a drink offering. Lord, I'm offering my inclinations. I'm offering my resolutions, my determinations, my mind, my will, my emotion. I'm offering those as a drink offering to you. I'm pouring them out on the ground. I'm not trusting in those. I'm not going to trust in those. I'm not going to rely upon them. I'm pouring them out before you. And instead, I'm going to put my trust in you at all times. The word here for trust, it means to be careless. It means to be secure, to feel safe, and to be confident. It means to throw something on the back. In other words, to cast my care upon the Lord. Let's put it in practical terms as we draw to a close tonight. You're in a situation. A circumstance comes up. Something's going on with a member of your family. Something's going on with your finances. Something's going on with your health. Something's going on with your circumstances. Something you're responsible for starts to fall apart. Somebody starts to talk about you. Some situations developing around you. The enemy's putting pressure on you. Guess what's happening? What's happening is the enemy is trying to get your attention, trying to consult with you. He's trying to get involved in a conversation with you. He's trying to advise you. Why? One reason. He wants to pull you out of the lofty, high refuge and position of defense of the spirit and start to agitate your flesh. Has that happened to you this week? Something going on and you don't feel like you're being fairly treated? And the enemy will come along. You're not being fairly treated right now. Somebody's not acting right towards you. Well, your emotions get stirred up. Then your brain starts working. Then your will gets engaged. And then all of a sudden you're acting out of the flesh. Something's going on with one of your kids and all of a sudden you get worried and fearful. The enemy assails you. What's going to happen? Where are they going to end up? What's going to take place? What's going to, what's going to be the outcome? And before long you're worried, you're fearful. He is imagining mischief against you and he's engaging you in these things. Why? He wants you to pull out of the spirit into the flesh. Because once he's got you in the flesh, he's got you in his control. Now he can begin to agitate. He can get you confused. He can get you acting out of fleshly things and making wrong decisions and choices. What do you have to do? You got to stop and say, wait a minute. I'm dead to all those things. I've been crucified with Christ. I don't have to live by the attitudes of the world. I don't have to live by or be controlled by my flesh. I'm not a debtor to my flesh anymore. I'm not a debtor to the enemy. I've been delivered from the enemy, delivered out of the kingdom of darkness and translated in the kingdom of God's dear son. All of this stuff, you're slain, all of you. You're a leaning wall. You're a tottering fence. You're only engaging me in conversation to try and cast me down from my high position. And everything you're saying is subterfuge and duplicity and mixed motives. You may be loud, but what you're saying is not true. Instead, I'm going to speak to my soul and say, my soul, wait 
silently for God alone. Brain, be quiet. Emotions, settle down. Will, disengage. Passions, be still. My soul is going to now wait silently on God alone. Lord, here's the situation. Taking a deep breath. Silently, silenting my soul and my fleshly activity. Now I'm going up to that place where your life is. I'm dead and my life is hidden with Christ in God. And where is Christ? If you be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above. Where Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father. Set your affections on things above and not on things of the earth. For you're dead and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ who is your life appears, you'll start to appear with him in glory. So you get still and you say, Lord, you not only save me, you are my salvation. You not only put me on a rock, you are my rock. You not only give me a place of refuge, you are the refuge itself. Your life, your presence, your f uh, life is the thing that is going to face this situation through me. Now, in God is my salvation, I'm not going to be shaken by this. I have a calm resolve. Jesus is going to handle this. Jesus, here it is. Here's the circumstance. Here's the situation. Here's the opportunity. Here's the temptation. I thank you that I can't, but you can. I don't have the answer, but you've got the answer. I don't know what to do, but you know what to do. Now, be my salvation. Be my refuge. Work through me right now. And here's the good news. In God is my salvation and my glory. What is my glory? Christ in me is the hope of glory. He is going to handle this situation gloriously. A situation I couldn't handle that would shake me to the core, that my flesh would get agitated by, as I operate in the calm resolve of his life, he's going to solve this issue. So trust in him at all times. And guess what we're going to do with our resolve, with our inclinations, with our determination, with our heart, our soul, our mind, our understanding. We're going to pour it out like a drink offering before the Lord. Saints, listen to me. Don't hold on to your resolution and your determination and your inclination. But Lord, I, I don't know what you're going to do. Lord, I don't know if you're going to handle this. Lord, I don't know how you... I'm going to cast my care upon you and my inclination, I'm pouring it out like a drink off. I'm not even going to rely upon it. I'm not even going to leave it in the jar in case I could go back to it and draw upon it. I'm pouring it out. This is the most important part of what I'm saying to you. You got to take your inclination pour it out on the ground. If I'm trusting in the Lord, I don't need to hold on to this. I can pour it out like a drink offering before the Lord because I'm going to the well that's inside that's going to spring up. I don't need to hold on to my little bottle of inclinations, resolutions, and determinations. Saints, I pray that this starts to quicken something in your heart. Are you living in panic? Are you allowing the enemy to give you that shout at, frantic, assailing attitude, agitated? Or have you found, are you finding that calm resolve that happens when we trust in him as our Yeshua, our salvation? Let's take our inclinations and pour them out. And let's incline our heart to him. Cast our burden on him. Trust in him and let him be our salvation. Let's pray tonight. Lord Jesus, what a precious, precious thing your word is. 
and how rich and wonderful it is. The revelation never ends. It's fathomless. Lord, I know what it's like to trust in me. I know what it's like to rely upon me. I know what it's like to be shaken to the very core by circumstances I can't control. But thanks be to the Lord, I am learning every day more and more what it's like to come up to that high, lofty place of the Spirit where your life is, to let you be my life, to silent my soul and allow your Spirit to live through me and face the circumstances of life. Lord Jesus, let that be our new living experience. Teach us how to live out of the calm resolve of the Spirit. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Sending our love and prayers to you. Take those willful determinations. Pour them out. And then cast your cares on the Lord and watch what he does. Amen. God bless you tonight. Good night.